Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to PwC Herald Talks. Now in year three, the business series, examining a range of current and upcoming trends and topics in business, if you want to do a sporting analogy, is the America's Cup. Thinking globally, taking on the world in Bermuda, but acting locally at the same time. In the 1960s, we had one of the highest standards of living in the world. We were literally living off the sheep's back. The biggest obstacles we faced in trade were, of course, those of distance and time. The time it took to travel to market. Then the 70s came along, the oil shock, Britain entering the EU. It meant we had to reshape and rethink the way we do business globally. So if you fast forward, look at what the internet has given us. It's given us a globally interconnected world. But a globally interconnected world also means a world of opportunity. When I was uh, about 18 years old, uh, my brother decided he was going to um, set up a little factory in New Zealand to make these kit sets and sort of commercialise it further so we could sell the stores. So he took a, a shed on my parents' dairy farm and we converted that into sort of like a little miniature factory. I'd help out my school holidays. And then we were sitting there one day and he said, in my school holidays, I'd actually done one year of law here in Vic, and he said, why don't we go to China? Why don't we go to China to build this business? We then went up to Shantou, China and we got a little apartment. It was about eight stories, had no lift. It cost, I think, $20, $25 New Zealand a rent, uh, in rent per month. And we sort of, that, that was sort of our home to begin with. We realized that Shantou was a place we didn't want to be, so we moved to Guangzhou. We went and got this tiny little factory, maybe half the size of this theater, and it was basically a tin shed in China as well. And we spent half of our $20,000 on an injection molding machine. So we bought our first injection molding machine, and then we physically welded our first production line and started hiring our first people. And I was like, now I have to start selling these. And so I started hammering toy bar after toy bar after toy bar with emails and phone calls. So then I'd find buyers, I'd like find, go, find their, go to their hotels, um, find the room numbers they were in, post letters and samples under their doors. And then one day I got this email back, it was all in caps locks. And it said, Nick, I do not have time for your daily email communication. Please stop emailing me every single day with about 50 exclamation marks. And then I'd write back to her, always apologetically, hey, Jean, I'm so sorry to like, bother you again. I'm really sorry that this is like, upsetting you. But I'm just really passionate about my product, and I really think you should give us a shot. And we're this, that, and that. And we're doing all these things, and we're great, and, which we weren't. We had like one product. Um, and in the end, she said, send me a sample. That was the only thing I got back, send me a sample. So I sent her a sample. And then suddenly I got a container order for like 25,000 pieces of this night frisbee from her, um, just from literally emailing her every single day um, and never meeting her. Um, she ended up getting sued because we were getting sued for this product. It ended up being a mess. We didn't have business with them with years after either. But, <laughs> um, but the, the moral of the story, obviously, is, is you know, persistence. And then about six years ago, we had our first what I would call major hit. Um, with Robofish, and we sold 44 million pieces, it won five Toy of the Year awards, and that was what really kind of put us on the map. Uh, this year we'll have three of the top 10 toys in the world. The key lesson, I think, in building a really global business is when I first went over there, I had full confidence, and I always kind of thought big. That was always my mindset, so always think big. Think as big as you possibly can. So you've got to be hungry, and you've got to be passionate about what you do. If you're not passionate about what you do, you won't be any good at it, because it's hard. You have to be relentless for a long time. I think it's the most powerful word in business, the word simple. Simplicity is the key to building a powerful business. Every single concept that I find that works has almost that formula. So it's 80% familiar, and it has that little twist, that little bit of um, innovation, or that little bit of a competitive advantage that means that you can win. Clients nowadays are wanting the best that they can get, and that's unfortunately not necessarily in New Zealand. But if we want to build a global, a global brand and bring on the best people to work for us, we've actually got to create a business model where people want to come and, come and work for us. So they want, to come, they want to be able to live in Invercargill, or live in Nelson, or, or live in Fongery, and not necessarily work on projects in those local areas. Getting good key staff is, is, uh, is, is, is difficult in the markets. Um, um, we've actually spent a lot, invested a lot of time over the last four years actually gearing up our staff in India 
um, to the New Zealand Australia standards, so they actually um, know the New Zealand building code and, and actually document to that. Um, so then we have key people that actually then um, trains the new staff that come in. So I, I guess um, staff retention but also finding people, the right people. Um, but I think our staff actually really um, appreciate working for a New Zealand company. Um, the, we, we're different when it comes to, um, to management. Um, we value our staffs and we, we uh, pay them exceptionally well compared to the market that we're in. And there are four things they tell us about doing business with New Zealanders. And they say, first of all, uh, turn up on time. Really get to know your market and understand how complex this is. You're in the big world now, so turn up on time. The second thing is be prepared. And so they're often uh, bemused by how unprepared we are when we turn up overseas. We think what will work in one country will work in another, and we need to do a lot more preparation and work there. The third thing, and that's really the most important, is they say, what are you trying to sell me? What's your value proposition? What's your pitch? Um, and, you know, Kiwis are well renowned for, for solving problems, so we often walk in and go, well, what would you like? We can do that. We can do anything, versus here's what I've got to offer. So they're looking for a really clear pitch. And then the fourth thing, which I think is be f pretty familiar for the rest of the audience, is close the deal. You know, you rely on your partnerships and the relationships you've built um, over the years as well, because you rely on each other to, to get through it. But we've come out in a, in a very strong space um, from those. So, and I think, you know, as, as we mentioned earlier, from a New Zealand story point of view or from other Kiwis, Kiwis um, are, are great at sticking together, um, particularly when you're in a, in a state of bother. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, we rest on that. I think the cooperative story, the dairy cooperative story in New Zealand is amazing because it's one, you know, one, it's, it is, these issues or these speed bumps happen uh, and have happened through history. Uh, markets closing, issues that have happened and sticking together and working together and collaborating uh, has got us through those um, through the, through the, since the 1880s. Uh, you know, the world is changing at such a fast pace. You know, half the jobs that are here today aren't going to be here in 30 years. They're going to be taken over by automation, by artificial intelligence. Your car's going to drive itself, you know, all of these things. So the world's changing at this pace, and our education kind of just keeps going along at, at this pace. And so I, I sort of <laughs> talked to Simon about this the other day, and I said, it's kind of like Australian rugby. You know, if, <laughs> if you ignore the grassroots, you're never going to be able to play in the big leagues. <laughs> And it's kind of the same thing, right? Like if we don't teach our kids entrepreneurship, if we don't teach our kids coding, if we don't have options for showing them about digital and social marketing, if we're not teaching them about artificial intelligence and automation, then they're never gonna be great at it further, further down the track and we're never gonna create companies. So we can keep relying on you know, agriculture, tourism and education, but New Zealand can be so much more. Hopefully you've got plenty of takeaways into how to take your business to the next level and achieve global domination. Ladies and gentlemen, get out there, apply these things. We look forward to hearing about your global success. Go forth.